want to thank you once again on this Sunday morning, Lord, to join together with us, Lord, in praising and worship the Lord. No matter where we are, one thing we know there, the Lord is with us. He promised unto us not to ever leave us, not to ever forsake us, but to, to be with us until the end of the ages. And the Bible promised that when two or three come together in His name, He's going to be in our midst. So we know that the Lord is going to be with us. He's going to be in this room. He's going to be in the place where you are, you know, gathered to listen to this, this live streaming. So let's, let's become in one heart and one mind and let's concentrate upon the Lord because God truly is our helper and is our refuge. But we thank you once again, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given unto us, Lord, to gather together, Lord, in this house, Lord, for the purpose, Lord, to worship you, to, to sing the songs of Zion, Lord, to, to speak about your word, to speak about your faithfulness, Lord. God, we ask you that every word that we, we said this, this morning, Lord, it will be said for one purpose and one purpose alone, to number one, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, and also to bring encouragement and hope to those who are going through this pandemic floor. God, we thank you for our eyes are fixed upon you, and we thank you once again for all that you're going to do, and we give the glory and God in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
truly believe in God? How do you believe in? Do you believe with your mind? Or do you believe with your heart? The Bible tells us that we must believe, but we must believe with our, with our heart, not just with our mind. There's a lot of fear in the world. I don't have to tell you. All you have to do is watch the news. Look at people. Go to the store and see how people are fearful. Be afraid. Not only there's a lot of fear in the world today, there is also a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of uncertainty how long in this virus is going to last. How much longer? How many more people need to die? There is also a lot of pain in the world right now. The dead bodies are accumulating. Family have been turning apart. Loved one is being taken away. And the sad thing is that we can even give them a nice funeral because we are not allowed to gather together. We are not allowed to come together and pay to them the last respect. So it's not a very present world we're living in. We watch the news. We read the newspaper. And we are constantly reminded of the severity of the situation we are facing. How much longer before it's going to get better? But I wanted to tell I want to tell you something this morning. I don't know what you believe about God. I don't know what your idea about God is. But I want you to think for a moment that God is sitting up in heaven and enjoying what is going on on the earth. I don't want you to think for a moment that God is not concerned what is taking place upon the face of the earth. The scripture tells us very clear that God is a God of love. We are reminded in the scripture not just once but many, many, many times how God heart breaks when he sees suffering. I remember the story of Mary, Martha, Lazarus, I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. One day Lazarus became sick, and Jesus was not around, so the sisters sent news to Jesus to come right away and to pray for her son because he was on the point of death. But Jesus took a little longer to get there. By the time Jesus got to the house of Mary and Martha, Lazarus was dead. And then Jesus asked them to bring him to the place where Lazarus was, had been buried. And the scripture tells that as Jesus was standing in front of the tomb of Lazarus, he wept. I want you to imagine for a minute the creator of the universe, God in the flesh, he was weeping. He was weeping. Now there's a lot of speculation why was Jesus weeping. Some people said he was weeping because he felt sorry about Mary and Martha. I don't think that's the reason. Because Jesus knew that in a few minutes Lazarus would be brought back to life. And he would be given back to his sisters alive. There's a lot of speculation uh, that Jesus was weeping because... He was too late, but I don't think so, because God knew in His plan and His purpose that this thing was not going to be for death, but was to be for the glory of God. I think there's a reason why Jesus was weeping as He was standing in front of Lazarus' tomb, because as He was looking around, He saw many tombs. As I was looking around, He saw many graves, and beyond every, every tomb, behind them in graves, there's a story of pain, there's a story of suffering, there's a story of separation, and as Jesus was looking around, his mind went back to the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, and when God created everything and he said that everything was good, 
God created a perfect world. But we, because of sin, disobedience, rebellion, we made a mess of God's creation. And that's why the reason Jesus was weeping. Because of the pain, the suffering, the death, the sin brought him into the world. So I don't want you to think for a minute that God is not concerned about the thing that you're going through. It's concerned. And He cares for you. And He's waiting for you to call upon Him. To invite Him into your situation. To invite Him into your circumstance. To bring Him in. In whatever life situation you are facing. And God is going to help you. See, as believers, as children of the living God, especially in time like this that we are living today, we have an assurance. We have a hope. And the Apostle Paul called this the blessed hope. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, we read this word. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Paul said the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, something that you and I did not deserve, but something that God, because He is love and is merciful and is gracious, He wanted to give it to us. For the grace of God has appeared. What is the grace of God? The grace of God is Jesus coming into the world. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Son, so full of glory and so full of mercy. That's the grace of God, Jesus Christ. So Paul said that the grace of God, Jesus, has appeared to all men. I want you to know that not to a specific group of people, not to a specific race, not to a specific nation, not to a specific uh, call people, but he has, uh, he has appeared to all men. Regardless who they are, the grace of God has appeared to all men. Why did he appear? Huh? The Bible makes very clear to bring salvation. We had a problem. And the problem was a sin that separated us from the from God. Sin that separated us from a holy God. But God said, I want to do something about. I, I, I don't want my creation. I don't want these people to be separate with me. I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna demonstrate to them. And I'm going to give them an opportunity to make things right. So the grace of God is up here to all men to bring salvation. Aren't you glad this morning that if you are a child of God, if you are a believer, he's not a sinner anymore, but you are a child of God. You are a son and daughter of God. You belong to him. Your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life. And Paul said that the grace of God that has appeared to all men to bring salvation teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly love we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. See what the grace of God does when you understand who Jesus is when you understand how much God loves you, and when you understand the extent of God's love, you have no other choice. Like the Apostle Paul said to renounce ungodliness, to renounce worldly lust, and to begin living a life that is pleasing unto God. He began to live it in such a way that you demonstrate 
self-control. That you begin in living such a way that you demonstrate the love of God to those who are around you. But most of all, that we demonstrate how much we love God by the action we do. And then Paul said this in verse 13, looking, looking. See, Christian believer, we always should be looking. What we should be looking? Huh? What we should be looking? The Apostle Paul give us the answer. We should be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we should be looking. We should be looking for the appearing of our great God, of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the blessed hope for the church. We have something that we are looking for. We are not looking to all the problem that is in the world. We are we look at the problem, but we are not getting discouraged. We are not getting down because we know that there's something that is coming. There's someone that is coming. And his name is Jesus. It came the first time. It will come again the second time. And Paul said we we should we should be looking for the blessed hope. It's a blessed hope. It's a blessed hope. And the glorious appearing. It's a glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you looking for Him? Huh? What you looking for? Looking, our eyes should be fixed, our mind should be fixed. Looking, 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 looking for Jesus. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Jesus speak to we found the seven letters to the churches. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus described the three churches, the three groups of believers. They are going to be present when he prepared himself to come back. It's going to be what is called the dead church. Dead. Jesus said, I know your work. And the dead church is represented by, by the church of Sardis. In your spare time, you can read Revelation chapter 3. And Jesus said, I know your work. You look alive. So you are dead. And there's a lot of churches like that. They're busy, they're busy, they're busy, they're busy, they're busy doing things. But they are dead spiritually. There's no spiritual life in them. They do things just because they have to do it. And then we found the lukewarm church. They are not too hot. They are not too cold. They lukewarm. They just satisfy. This represents the church which has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This represents Christian who won the, both, the best of both worlds. But Jesus rebuked them and Jesus tell them that unless they become hot, it's going to puke, it's going to vomit out of their mouth. And then we found the church of Philadelphia, the church which is on fire for God. And in Revelation chapter 3, God makes a promise to them. Look what it said in verse 10. Because you have kept 
my command to persevere. Because you've been persevering. Because you're not giving up. Because you're not allowing, you have not allowed anything to prevent you from moving forward, from pressing on. Because you have been faithful in everything that I command you. Jesus said, because you have kept my command to persevere. Look what it said. I also will keep you from the hour of trial that shall come upon the whole herd to test those who dwell on the earth. Jesus said there is a hour of trial. There's a period of time that I'm going to send upon the face of the earth. There's going to be a period of tribulation that will come upon the face of the earth. But because... You have persevered because you have remained faithful to me. Because you have done all this in the past as a reward. I'm going to keep you from this hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world. Notice, it. it said it's coming upon the whole world. Not just part of the world, but it's coming upon all world. To test the inhabitant of the world. To see what's in their heart. To see what's in their mind. To see where their dedication and passion are. To see where the commitment is given to. But Jesus said, because you have persevered, because you have remained faithful to me, I'm going to keep you from this hour of tribulation. I'm going to keep you from this hour of trouble that will come upon the future. I'm going to remove you. And you will now have to go through. I will spare you from the hour A trial that is coming. Could it be that this pandemic that we are facing right now, could it be that this pandemic which is affecting the all world could be the beginning of the hour or trial? That is coming upon the eight, the face of the earth. Could it be? Could it be? Jesus said that the hour of trial will affect the whole world. Should be afraid? No. Why? Because we're looking. For the blessed hope. We're looking for someone. Who said. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You also believe in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come again. That where I am. You might be also. That's the great God. And that's our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who spoke those words. We're looking. We're looking. We're looking for the blessed hope. We're looking for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When? When evil is going to come again? Huh? You know, people have been looking for Jesus' return for the many years. How's he going to come back? The Bible tells us a few things about this. The first thing that we know is that when Jesus is going to come, it's going to be unexpected. It's going to be 
and expected. There will be no pre-announcement. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming to an hour that you do not expect. Jesus clearly states that He's going to come back at an hour when people will not be expecting Him. People will be busy with their own life. People will be busy with doing their own thing. And God is not in their mind. There's no room in their life. There's no place in their life for God. And God said, I want you to be ready. All, all the time. Because you don't know. You don't know when I'm going to come back. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus said, But of the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only. Something else that Jesus said, that no one knows the day, no one knows the hour, is unexpected. It's reserved to the Father. That's why we must be ready. That's why we must watch. That's why we must look. Because we don't know the hours. We don't know the time. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that by concerning the time and the season, brother, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourself know perfectly. Paul said, you know perfectly that the, day, that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Paul said, you know. We spoke about this. The Holy Spirit revealed unto us. And we know surely that the day of the Lord, the, the blessed hope, the appearing, of our glories of God and Savior Jesus Christ, He will come as a thief in the night. For when they will say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pain upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. As a thief in the night. Have you ever been a victim of a thief? Have you ever been a victim of somebody that breaks into your house and takes things that don't belong to them? They don't call in advance. They don't warn you. They wait until you leave the premises. And when you're not around, they do the work. And Paul said that Jesus is coming back as a thief. In the night. Unexpected. Unexpected. Paul give us some more detail. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 52 he said, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. That's how quick it's going to be. Blink your eyes. That's how quick it's going to be when Jesus is going to return. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and corrupted, and we shall be changed. In a twinkling of an eye, what's going to happen? What is going to happen when the Savior, Jesus, coming back? Huh? What is going to happen? The 
Bible tells us that when Jesus is going to come back, his return is going to be in two stages. The first stage is what's called the rapture of the church. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to be quick. It's going to be as a thief in the night. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 16, Paul said, for the Lord himself, now that notice, He's not, he's not going to send an angel. He's not going to send angels. For the Lord himself, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of a great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord himself. The Lord himself. In the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 11, that Jesus is talking to the disciple, and as he's talking to the disciple, he's taken up to heaven in the cloud. And the disciple gazing up to heaven, looking Jesus being taken away from them. Then an angel appeared to them and said, Hey, why are you gazing up to the sky? The same Jesus is God who is being taken away from you, he will return. Likewise. And Paul said, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. That's where Jesus is right now. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father. He has taken his place of authority. But it's going to come a day when the Father says, Son, the time is ready. The time is right. The hour of trial is about to begin upon the face of the earth. So I want you to go. And I want you to take away those who have been persevering, those who have been remained faithful to us, those who have done what we ask them to do. So for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel. And with the trumpet of God. And when the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, Paul tells us that something's going to happen. The dead in Christ will rise first. Every believer Every Christian who is dead, whose body is been buried under the ground, Paul said, they will rise for their spirit that right now is in heaven and the presence of God. It will, descend, it will come back with the Lord. And when the Lord will descend from heaven, the dead in Christ will rise for their spirit will be reunited with their dead body and they will come to light but then he does not stop there and then he said we we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air and then we we'll shall always be with the Lord I want you to take picture in a twinkling of an eye all this is going to take place. The Lord will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of the God. And when the Lord makes his way down from heaven, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we, who are at that moment, are still alive, 
We have this physical body. We're living on this earth. Together with them. Are going to be caught up. And, what, and, what, and we are going to be taken up. To meet the Lord. In the air. This is the blessed hope. That the Apostle Paul speaks. This is the, uh, the blessed hope of the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this blessed hope can take place anytime. There's no prophecy that must be fulfilled. There's nothing that must be taking place in our land. Every promise has been fulfilled. That's why the Bible said, looking. That's why the Bible said, watch. That's why the Bible said, be ready. Because let me tell you something. When this event takes place, when the blessed hope takes place, there will be no time to repent. There will be no time to make things right with God. Once you miss it, your destiny has already been determined because you had a chance. You had an opportunity. You knew the truth. You need disregard the truth. I'll be ready. I'll be ready. I hope that you who are listening to me this morning will understand the urgency of times. I don't know and no one knows except God for the next minute has in store. The next week, the next month, the only thing that we have guaranteed is right now. That's the only thing that you have, you have guaranteed right now. And right now, we must take advantage of this opportunity that we have to get ready. To get ready for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. If you're not ready, if you're honest you, with yourself, and you look at your life and you say, no man, I'm not ready. If these will come right now, I, I, I'm not ready. Then get ready. Get ready. Get ready. The Bible said if we confess our sins, <clears throat> is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is merciful. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to get ready. He wants you to get ready for the appearing of our great God and favorite Jesus Christ. If you would like, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you. For the Savior. Jesus Christ. Is coming again. I ask you to forgive me. Of all the wrongs that I've done. I ask you to help me Lord. To be ready. To the appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, help me to live for you every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. <coughs> amen and amen. You know, today is the first Sunday of the month. 
we should you we usually take communion the first time of the month. So we are going to take communion um, here, and but we ask you to join together with us. So Josephine is going to sing a song. So you know, right where you are, just get some piece of bread. If you have some juice, just take it, <coughs> and then we all partake together after the song is over. So I'll give you some time for you to, if you have not prepared, to get some bread and juice, and then we partake together after the song is over. <coughs>
night that the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed to bread, and then he broke it. And then he gave to the disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And after he gave thanks, he gave to his disciples and he said, Drink, this is the cup of the new, co the new covenant for the remission of your sin. Do this as often as you want in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. By the help of not to ever forget, through the grace of God, to bring salvation, has appeared to all men. For you love the world so much that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but has everlasting life. God, I pray that everyone will embrace this gift that you made available to everyone. And they will make Jesus the Lord and favor of life. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done this morning. And we give the glory to God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.